Oh, oh bloody. Hey, stop changing the channel, man. I'm, try I'm trying to watch something. Like, that's just not cool. Hello everybody, I'm High Treason. As the title of this video suggests, we're going to have a look at some old ISA capture cards, specifically from Hopage. I guess that's how you pronounce it, I've never really been sure. It's a very strange name. Uh, we will look at an ATI right at the end. These aren't the oldest cards, but they're sort of old enough that they're usable and accessible for the most part. I don't really have anything older. We might might investigate in the future, but I, I can't really think of what use they would be to me, and I don't really get things if I can't think of a use for them. Still, I guess we'll get on with it, but first I just want to quickly say that I do feel quite bad, because I'm, I'm not doing what I said I would do here, I, I'm breaking my promise. That's down to factors beyond my control. I'm going to record an, an, an update video separately, I'll tell you what happened with my attempts to film what I said I would film, and you know, what's going to happen about it later down the line. But, yeah, uh, this video is going to be long, I already know, so let's get on with it before this drags. Video capture devices are fairly commonplace now, what with every man and his dog trying to cash in on live streaming or similar digital videos. But only within the last decade have they become so widespread. Going back in time to 2005, when my Pentium D was built, very few people had any video capture devices. Even the most serious computer enthusiasts probably wouldn't have one, and it was something of a novelty if you did. I certainly have memories of early YouTube where everybody but me, it seemed, just filmed things off of the screen. Now, as you probably know, I did have a capture card, because the Pentium D was built as a video workstation from day one, featuring a WinTV Express at that time. This proved to be a small novelty to some of my friends who, despite being interested in such things, some of them even pretty hardcore enthusiasts, and building their own machines, had never actually seen such a device operating first hand. Now let's go back another ten years, you really would be something of a talking point if you possessed such a peripheral. I would imagine most people didn't even know they existed. Video in any form was still quite uncommon on personal computers at that time, and many of the machines running weren't really very capable when it came to doing things like that. In fact, Windows 95 included some videos on the CD-ROM, which could serve as a good example for just how limited we were in that department, and that assumed you were lucky enough to own a machine that was capable of running Windows 95. It wasn't uncommon to buy a 286 second hand because of how much computers cost at that time, where well, Windows 95 was most likely tested on a modest 486 system, as far as I can tell. Don't quote me on that one. To that effect, it may be worth taking a moment to put this into perspective. Two years prior, in 1993, Intel released the Pentium to replace the 486, a processor which had been around since 1989. So, what do you think the best-selling CPU was that year? Well, I don't know for certain, but we can make an educated guess from reading magazines and old Usenet posts from that time period, and seeing what the average system seems to be, and it seems the 3860X was selling far more than any other chip at that time. Yes, that's right, a processor from seven years prior, though mostly at 33 or 40 megahertz. With a good video card, these machines might just be able to play a low quality video one file, but with every chance you only had four to eight megabytes of RAM, it wouldn't be pretty if you had anything else running. And that's assuming your puny 20 megabyte hard drive didn't fill up, or your pathetic 256k of video RAM, limiting your resolution and colour depth, didn't make everything unbearably ugly when the video tried to grab the screen palette. Even then, the world wasn't completely PC orientated yet. Many still swore by the arguably more capable Amiga, and there was still a rather large number of people using older microcomputers like the Commodore 64 or Atari ST, or even the Spectrum. It wasn't that uncommon, and nobody actually thought it was weird. By 1995, things had only marginally improved unless you had the money to throw around, 
and it likely wasn't a wise investment to buy a new PC at that point because of how quickly the technology was changing. It'd be obsolete within a few weeks, I almost guarantee it. You'd just feel stupid. I personally cruised into 2001 still running a 25 MHz 386 SLC, and again, nobody really thought it was that strange, it was just, I owned the computer. Yes, I would have liked a faster one, but you just didn't notice. Now getting away from this little tangent, video grabbing had existed for quite a long time by now, but it used strange hardware and it generally wasn't standardised in any way at all. In many cases, it could only grab a single frame or a very short clip of a few seconds in length early on. I don't own any grabbing hardware from that far back, but I own a card that was designed to interface with something along those lines as described in its manual. Now I'd like to track this add-on down someday, but I'm doubtful I'll ever find one. The video card is itself interesting though, we might have to look at that in brief someday, and I have a plan as to how we can do that, because I don't think it deserves its own video, but... Well, yeah, we'll see what happens, I have ideas. Somebody's going to notice, so I should probably interrupt here to point out that this Ava is not what you think it is. This is actually made by a company called Ada. this uh, card in my 386. And, yeah, the 2000 is an input device. I can only imagine how awkward the grabbing card would have been for this, though, given it is 1992 technology. Hopage, the makers of the WinTV, assuming that's how you pronounce it, also had their hands in the market in 1992, but information on their old devices is very difficult to find. In fact, I seem to be noticing a pattern that as we delve into these odd peripherals more and more, documentation just isn't there. We will come back to these earlier Hopage cards at a later time, though. Meanwhile, here's the subject of today's video. It's a Hopage WinTV celebrity. You can tell how times have changed just by the name of the product range. WinTV. It implies that these were mostly for watching television. Who even does that? Most capture hardware today comes without a tuner installed, and I can't even test this one as I don't have anything which outputs NTSC RF signals or uses this weird cable connector that you guys like using in North America. I mean, yeah, we have these over here. No thread on them. That's totally better, right? You know, because... Yeah. Oh, man, how are the excuses to import one of those ugly American SNES consoles are mounting up by the day? But yeah, we won't be able to test this feature properly today. There's there's no analog TV signals here anyway, but then... I mean, television's rubbish now, so who the hell cares, really? You can undoubtedly see just how large this thing is, and I honestly can't get it back out of the computer without dismantling practically everything in there. We'd have to remove all of the other expansion cards and tilt things awkwardly and disconnect a bunch of cables. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not doing it, because it's, it's a lot of work to get this thing going. I mean, we've seen this machine before, and I've told you it's complicated, and, well, yeah, you, you can probably gather just how complicated this thing really is. Huh, how did that get there? It's a little bit precarious. However, the celebrity is definitely deserving of the title full-length card at any rate. Now, I believe there is a different version which is substantially shorter than this, though I've no idea how different the hardware on board might be, and I don't have one, so, well, I can't really do a comparison, but... If it uses the same drives and such, you'd think it was probably just a more compacted version of the same thing. Either way, this was clearly pushing the limits of integration at the time it was built, and it runs really, really hot. Pushing out enough heat that I have considered applying heat sinks to the LSI chips and such. I have reason to suspect the power draws quite high. It should be okay, though. I'd imagine the parts are rated for what they're running at, and, well, we've got fans in the case that are blowing things around, so we should be okay. I hope. You'll notice that there are jumps and headers dotted around the card, and in part that's because it's not plug and pray capable, so you have to set the resources up manually. That doesn't get rid of the pray part, though. It's, it's still, like, set it up manually in pray. 
I can show you another card, one which is essentially a cut down version of the Celebrity and High Q. Now, the High Q is basically an upgraded Celebrity as far as I can tell. It just features the high performance upgrade, that one memory chip in the socket there already installed from the factory. But I don't have one of those cards, so I don't know. That might not be the case. That's just how it seems to be. They seem very similar. The manual uses the same thing for both models. But the cut down version of these is the Cinema Pro, and I do have one of those. It's a plug and play capable card with slightly less versatility when it comes to capturing. It's not quite as good at that. It does make up for it by allowing for running alongside a second Cinema Pro card, though. I'm not really sure why anybody would want to do that outside of maybe a CCTV system, as you would have four composite inputs under this setup. But, well, I guess somebody must have wanted to do it. Again, there are headers for expansion, things like MPEG cards or Teletext modules, things like that, which I don't have and can't really think of a use for, and probably wouldn't be able to track one down if I did want one anyway, so, yeah, good luck with that. The Cinema Pro card is a little bit smaller, but both rely on the AuraVision VPX chipset, albeit with a slightly different version of the chip as far as I can tell. I would imagine internally it's much the same. I suspect this AuraVision is a video processor and encoder of some kind, likely for the YUV codec that you can use or some such. Interestingly, that there are an abundance of Brook Tree and Phillips parts on board, the two names that would stick around long after AuraVision disappeared from this field. Notably, Brook Tree brought the BT-848 and 878, and there were numerous incarnations of Phillips SAA-713, which I believe is still around today, vastly shrunk down and placed in these USB capture stick devices in... So from time to time at least, I think that's what mine uses. Yeah, that little stick there can do just about everything that this huge hunking card can do. You can clearly see that the Cinema Pro has only 512k of RAM on board, where the Celebrity has over 1 megabyte. In fact, with the upgrade chip, it's 1.5. I believe the main chips on the Celebrity are the Brooktree BT-812, which handles the video input sources and such, and this is alongside the AuraVision VPX, which handles processing and encoding of video streams, as far as I can tell. Overall, this card seems woefully complicated, and it's a little bit of a headache trying to figure out exactly what it's doing. I believe the Cinema Pro uses slightly updated chips. Now, one does not simply plug in a Win TV card and expect it to work. Not even the Cinema Pro with its fabled plug-and-play capabilities. Far from it. Firstly, you need to read the manual, which is a complete pain in the arse. You know, the front cover of the manual is white noise, isn't it? It's pretty white noise. I thought it was like a marble pattern, but no, that's definitely white noise. Given this is like a TV card, what the hell am I supposed to take away from that? I mean, that can't be good. That's sending completely the wrong message. What idiot came up with that? But it's in some weird order. They go on about operating the software for a few chapters before being like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you actually have to set the card up and, you know, set the system up before doing anything else. Which is possibly a factor in why Hoppage no longer make motherboards or dabble in floating point compilers because they probably tell you to install a heatsink long after installing the operating system. I do think they made some interesting boards. I, I'm sure they made a 486 board with an Intel 960 socket or some such at one point. I, I doubt I can find images of it, but I'm sure they did something weird like that. Oh yeah, by the way, the discs have handwritten labels on them, which is kind of weird. Nonetheless, this is where the fun starts. Because as with any old computer, you've got the joy of figuring out interrupts. Yeah, I find keeping track of these on the inside of the case with pencil helps immensely. Some of the time, I just remember my way around this machine, I know it quite well. The card tends to default to IRQ15, so you'll definitely need to change that if you have a second IDE channel. I don't, but my MAUI card is set to channel 15. We could probably share it, because they would never be in use at the same time, but well, it's up to you if you want to take that risk. I mean, you're not really supposed to share interrupts, but you can get away with it from time to time. 
Never share an interrupt with the hard drive interface, though. Like, I wouldn't set anything to 11, because that's where my SCSI card is, and, well, bad things could happen. So, are we done? Well, yeah, now set the base address with the jumpers, okay? That's it, right? Now we can install the card and install the software. Nope, because now you have to install the VGA pass-through cable. I think I spoke about these briefly some time ago, and, well, this is what they look like. They're pretty big and hefty-looking things, and uh, they do look kind of cool, actually. I mean, they, these look like serious stuff. The ISA bus isn't really fast enough to talk back and forth between this and the video card, nor were many machines fast enough in general to do this very well, so you interface with the video card using analog means. Yeah, you basically hijack the VGA signal and feed it into this card. Yeah, really fun times. This is a proprietary cable, and it's different on each card. The Cinema Pro, for example, uses a different cable despite interfacing the same way. And, well, that actually has a second cable to replace the cable it came with if you have an MPEG board installed, so... Yeah, there's a bit of a headache, and it's something to look out for if you're thinking of getting an old card like this. Because the cables are hard to find, and they're often not included. They're usually not cheap either, so just be aware of that. Also, drivers for these things are really hard to find. I had to piece them together myself from what I could get hold of to make the celebrity work. That aside, your monitor will now plug into the Win TV instead of your VGA card, for obvious reasons. If you had an antenna, you'd hook that up now, as well as connecting your sound card or speakers to the audio jack. So that's it, right? We are done now, surely? Nope, because it turns out the card uses 12-bit addressing, where most only use 10-bit. Right, well, as it turns out, this means the card actually conflicts with my game port, even though it's not the same address as the game port. Yeah, we'd better go back and change those jumpers. <sighs> Still not ready? Still not ready. Have you ever seen that memory hull or non-cacheable region option in the BIOS that you thought didn't do anything? Well, turn that on for wherever you're going to put the frame buffer for the card. You don't want the card's buffer being cached or overwritten by other functions, so this is important. So now we've got to be good. Nope, because we still have to exclude that address with EMM386. Uh, we also need to be careful of the base and buffer addresses, because some of them conflict with undocumented features of S3 cards, or else can be overwritten by segments of a frame buffer on such cards, more specifically diamond-branded cards, like my one, in particular. Right, is that it? Are we fucking done here? Can we start this abomination now? Good God, what an absolute headache. I mean, come on, I'm fucking to deal with this shit, man. You know, this is just lovely, isn't it? Imagine if you had to uninstall this thing. Yeah, wouldn't that fucking suck? By comparison, the software is easy to install, especially if you just want to watch incoming signals without capturing anything. But I want to capture things, so now I'm going to capture myself capturing things with a capture card. Oh god, this is what my life has come to, and my head kind of hurts. In defence of the software, it is quite tidy, and it's not hard to use at all. You might want to set up the display option to align and scale the picture, though, or else it's going to look like crap. And you'll need to do that again if you change the resolution, colour depth, refresh rate, and oddly, it seems to go out if I switch to certain monitors. Who knows, this is an analogue system, maybe it's pulling the voltages down or something, I've, I've no idea. Don't know much about how analogue video works, I'll admit that right here and now. It's sorcery to me. Now once you've set it up, so long as you leave everything alone, it should be okay. Probably. Maybe. Possibly. We can hope. The celebrity can interpolate fields and display both fields at once, which amuses me because the interlacing on the WinTV Express never really worked properly. In fact, if you've got an advanced menu, you can mess about with things like that quite in-depth. I think you press... Control alt d or something to get that up. 
you will probably have to go through the hardware setup window at least once. You don't actually need the IRQ or buffer address if you aren't capturing video and only want to view incoming signals, so you can ignore the bit about the BIOS and EMM386 if you're not using those features, but then if I didn't want them, I'd just plug my shit into a television or convert the signals to VGA and use my monitor, but I mean, that would be really boring. But where would be the fun in that, man? I like, I like the risks. Now, just for the hell of it, here's my 386 running that weird VGA card I showed you before and appearing on the WinTV's viewing window. It can take a while to lock onto signals from time to time, the WinTV, but that's nothing to worry about. It's just the way things work, really. It's usually pretty snappy, to be honest. Rather strangely, the card can sync to a progressive signal. Yeah, the, the Express from my Pentium D doesn't really do that. In fact, the Ava TV in my Athlon can't. My Mercury never really did that well, and the, the Easy Cap has some problems with it from what I remember. So, yeah, that's a surprise. It's a nice surprise, though. Despite what it says on the card, we're not actually limited to NTSC entirely because the composite and S-video inputs are capable of switching modes to PAL. Now, in theory, anything that works on my television should also work on here. So let me grab a VCR. Oh god, this brings back memories of when all my videos had to be fed out to VHS. Now, I had to butcher my Pentium 2 to get things onto VHS, and... It was CPU bound, so lag and blocking and tearing, you see, is from the, the source Pentium 2, not from the WinTV celebrity. Anyway, it works as expected, so, well, we can actually have this hooked up at the same time as the 386, because the card has two composite inputs when S-Video isn't in use. Uh, I probably should point out that those vertical bands you're seeing aren't visible on the monitor. That's something to do with my uh, DVI converter I'm using to record this to show you that it doesn't like the signals that come out of the WinTV card. It looks fine when it's plugged into a display. You wouldn't see that under normal use, so yeah, just try to ignore it. The signals from videotapes tend to fluctuate a little bit here and there especially on worn tapes like this one. It may be worth noting that both the StarTech and Intensity cards, which are fairly expensive modern capture solutions, yield nothing more than a blank screen or no signal graphic when connected to a VCR, because they can't lock onto the signal at all. Even the USB EasyCap struggles and tends to lose audio sync if recording from one due to dropping frames at random when there are uh, artifacts within the signal. In fact, the newest card of the bunch, the StarTech, handles this the worst by far out of anything else. Except maybe the Colossus, but we'll get there later. Because the onboard firmware will crash and lock the system up for a while until the card managed to shut down and reset itself. Now, sometimes it will fail to do this and will just crash the Xeon entirely. It seems the WinTV celebrity actually has the edge here for viewing such sources, which, yeah, I can't actually say I'm that surprised. All the cards tended to be much better at this. Now, it actually has another advantage, because the latency is practically zero. At least, I can't really pick out any latency, possibly because the card isn't really doing much in this mode of operation. It's barely talking back to the computer at all, outside of any signals used to control it. And, well, we don't have to wait for the images to be copied into the VGA card's frame buffer. Here's how it works. The computer controls the card, and then it draws a pink square onto the screen through the VGA card. You can actually see this briefly when loading the application, or interacting with the window, or else just plug in the monitor straight into the video card. All the card does at this stage is a little chroma keying, much like the weatherman on television does, and displays the signal behind the pink box after scaling it to the correct size. You can see this in Microsoft Paint if you start drawing pink shapes when the WinTV software is running behind it, so you're basically seeing the signal in real time, and the shades of pink that it will chroma key through are very, very broad. As a result of this, it's entirely possible to use the card for playing console games, like Rystar or even Yoshi's Island if you wanted to. 
Now I can't do that on most modern cards because they either display nothing due to the console not outputting an exact standard conforming signal, mostly due to their limited resolutions, or else they introduce latency, as is the case with the Easy Cap and even the WinTV Express, both of which have to write to system memory and be duplicated to the frame buffer when using the CPU to coordinate this whole process. It's, it's a bit of a mess. Cards like this ATI AMC card, I have no idea as to its proper name, presumably a TV wonder of some kind, can sometimes keep up if they use the similar method, but others will still be a little slower if they use digital interface and copy to the frame buffer of the video card. The advantages of cards using digital methods to get the picture across, where the VGA card displays captured images from its own buffer, is that they can produce a slightly better image quality and they're likely cheaper to produce. Also, with HD being the norm today, I really doubt analog would be practical anymore, but we're not really talking about that so much. Some newer cards like the Intensity actually allow output to their own monitor directly. The method the WinTV Celebrity uses offers another advantage though. You might remember my saying that viewing and grabbing signals on a computer had existed for some time, but I also said colour palettes, power and bandwidth were limited. Well, you mostly bypass the need for CPU power or extensive system memory as everything is handled by a dedicated analog video processing hardware on the WinTV card, and you also bypass the need for a powerful video card. You can still use a low 16 colour mode and see true colour images on the WinTV display because your video card only has to draw the software in that pink box. The WinTV does the rest by punching directly into the analogue signals. I'd imagine you could probably get away with running it on a relatively modest system. Unfortunately, there's no real feasible way for me to test that at the moment. From what I know, the ATI card I have is effectively working the same way, but using an internal cable, as in the AMC lead there, and not having a huge heavy metal thing sticking out the back of the case. It's a little more elegant, and as you can see, that, that will cut costs, I would imagine, if you were buying these new. Also, much like the S3 Scenics video playback, if you minimise the window, you get a real-time thumbnail preview on the desktop. You can also full screen the window or display it without controls. These features were still there in uh, WinTV 2000, minus the icon thumbnail. They'd got rid of that by then, which is a shame because I think that looks awesome. I suppose we should try an S video input. This uses both composite inputs at once, and I don't have the official adapter, but I do have the one from my Intensity Pro, which I know it's just a passive cable, but it's wired exactly the same. and. Yeah, that, that amuses me. I don't have many S-Video sources that are really any good, so here's a Japanese games console playing a few things. That picture is really quite sharp, all things considered. I can actually see individual pixels here. Granted, they're fairly big pixels, but the edges are far sharper than I expected them to be. That actually looks really, really good. Well, that's enough faffing around for the time being. Let's try capturing something. Obviously, this is somewhat limited by the computer you're using, and it can be problematic on systems as old as mine, because they weren't always fully standards compliant, often neglecting full NMI conformity somewhere. And the card makes use of some obscure low-level functions affected by this. Not to mention, my computer obviously isn't as fast as a top-of-the-line brand-new 133 MHz Pentium system would have been when this card appeared. I'd also expect a 1 megabyte 200 megahertz Pentium Pro, which was also from 95, to significantly outperform my poor old 66 megahertz Pentium in video related tasks. 
The P6 would basically have been the best for this until Netbast appeared. Interestingly, Hoppage did add Windows NT support to these cards, so there must have been a place for them in professional workstations. It even has to make changes at a hardware level, as there is a Windows NT mode jumper on the Cinema Pro. Anyway, enough prattling on about these things, we'll start by grabbing just one image. Now that's fairly easy to do, and it appears to do what I would expect of it. You can adjust the size, format, colour, depth, and just things like that. What, what the sort of things you'd expect. It does allow us to inspect things quite closely. See, it seems the card does work as expected. We can grab images from it into the computer, so in theory we should be able to capture video. It should be possible. We can view the image, of course, zoom in, save, general image type things. They're just normal bitmaps. There's nothing special about them. It's, it is just a 24-bit bitmap image. But yeah, we're done with that and it's time to move on to video capture. Capturing uses a different application, being MCI and Video for Windows compatible. The card can be used by third party applications pretty seamlessly. And I do have an old version of ULEAD around somewhere, but we'll use the included software for today because that's what we're talking about really, things like that. Still, perhaps in the future, we'll try producing an entire video from scratch on this machine. That could be quite fun to do. Anyways, overall, these things vary very little when it comes to MCI and Video for Windows capture devices, because the aim of these standards was, well, just that, to make such things pretty standard and make them work universally. The software might look different on the face of it, but the buttons will do the same thing, something many new cards seem to forget about. Props to Blackmagic Design, they did fix problems like that with the Intensity Pro as time went on, where ironically, Hoppage did not with their Colossus, a simply horrible card and one I wouldn't recommend owning at all, assuming they still make it. WinTV Capture is a fairly simple looking application and it offers a few settings we can adjust. This includes an alternate video mode where the card copies data to the video card's frame buffer, instead of using chroma keying, much like a modern software-driven capture card would do. This is painfully slow, but it is required for certain things to work. It shows why you didn't do this for viewing. Talk about bus contention. I'd like to emphasize how heavy it is on a system to do this. A brief example would be that full motion 720x576 streams with 12-bit color at 25 frames per second would require about 610 kibibytes per frame, or about 15 mibibytes per second. I believe that's the correct word. An impossible feat, because the 16-bit ISA bus is only able to transport 8.33 megabytes per second, one card at a time as it's a parallel bus, going flat out. And that is video only. We're not taking audio into account. I mean, sure, you could use compression. That's where hardware encoders would come in. You could also try software compression, but I wouldn't fancy the latter personally. You'd still be dealing with some serious bus saturation if your CPU was powerful enough in the first place. Also, these cards are extremely sensitive to non-standard bus clocks, so overclocking the ISA bus to get more bandwidth isn't really an option. A little way over, fast or slow, and it'll simply stop working. They're, they're extremely, extremely touchy about these things. We're also not taking into the account the strain caused by writing things back onto a bus in the system to store it on the hard drive. You can probably see why using an ISA IDE card would be quite detrimental here. This'll be why SCSI is the go-to option for this kind of workload. You better hope you have a large enough hard drive and that it is fast enough. Serious video workstations would definitely have been using SCSI as I am here. Ah, now to that fact, if I am correct in what I remember, the Amiga Video Toaster actually has its own hard drives on the flyer board. The Video Toaster Flyer has, I believe, three hard drives that it uses on its own. It has, uh, and they're SCSI drives, you have two for video, which are A and B roll, and a third for audio. So that gives you an idea what we're dealing with here, how far you were pushing this. And that makes sense because the Zoro 2 interface, which is what I believe it used, 
is oh, what is about 5.3 megabytes per second or something. Don't quote me on any of this because it's very rare I go outside of x86 stuff for that. It's, it's sort of unknown territories to me, it scares me a little bit and I don't know much about it but yeah it's, I know it's not quite as quick as the IS Airbus but it, it gives you an idea of what we're dealing with here that the, the flyer board has its own hard drives which might not be a bad idea in some respects probably get better quality out of a video toaster but I'm not sure and without having one to test I obviously can't test it for you and as much as I really, really miss my Amiga, I can't think of a legitimate reason to get another one, so, well, I guess we'll go back to X86 stuff now before this gets out of hand. It is an interesting time when you think about it where in regards to video, because you want to compress the video more because hard drives are small, but at the same time, you can't compress it that far because you just don't have the power to compress it that fast in the first place or decompress it again in real time, so... Yeah, it's a bit of a touchy time. Also, memory's expensive, so you can't just stuff huge buffers everywhere. Anyway, the software requires you to set a capture file. This is used to store the video before it's saved. I don't think this concept's entirely dissimilar to the early grabbers. I believe the ones that could grab a few second clips years and years ago probably used RAM on the card, and they would save it to the hard drive slowly as discs back then wouldn't have been fast enough to do this in real time. Of course, by the time this one came around, the hard drive was fast enough, so you just use the hard drive as that temporary buffer. You can adjust the input method and channels as you would in the regular WinTV application, Now the interface here is more menu-driven as opposed to being graphically inclined. It's not as pretty, but it's still easy to use. It's pretty obvious what everything will do, the video resolution, frame rate and other settings can be tampered with, as well as audio quality. These are going to vary dependent on your computer's capabilities. It can take a lot of blind testing to get the settings just right. Uncompressed video takes up a lot of space and it abuses the bus much more than compressed video will, but compressed video requires more power. You'd also have to be sure the codecs used were installed on any machine you transferred the files to and wanted to play them back on later. The manual talks about authoring video CD at one point, using video captured from the card. The included software can't do that, but it's a very odd thought, if only for how much debt you'd run up to do such things back then, and it definitely strikes me more as a Pentium Pro Windows NT workload than something I want to do with this Pentium 66 in Windows 3.1 for long periods of time. I'd quite like to try it. I have to admit, I'm having flashbacks to when I was stuck using that 33 MHz 486 for almost a year. Overall, I'm mostly limited to quarter resolution palletized video at 15 frames per second, which is pretty respectable for what we're using here, really. I would have shown you this regardless, as it's a bit more in-depth, it's a bit more hands-on. Full resolution, full speed, uncompressed 24-bit color video is a simpler far by comparison. You're just dumping what the card's seeing into the hard drive, whereas using compression or pallets requires a few extra stages, it's more involved and it's worth demonstrating, because you don't really have to do this sort of stuff now. Firstly, you will need to generate a palette for the capture to use. Probably not great if your favourite TV program just came on, as you'd miss the intro whilst messing with the palette. The palette's built with a few frames prior to recording, so it might not be right for the whole show that you want to record the clip of or whatever. Regardless, here's how it works. The, the system waits and the software grabs a few images into memory for analysis picking the most common and most likely colours to build itself a palette. You can now record the video and audio if you wish, The doing audio at the same time will obviously be more intensive on the system. Now, here's a trick I know. I've not said anything about it up to now, but my first capture card was actually one of these. It was a variation of this card. I'm not sure on the exact model, it may have been a high Q. And I sort of know what I can get away with, and I know a few little... Uh, things about this here. Now, here's something I remember from back then. So you'll notice there's no S-Video option in the capture program. Well, you can actually record from S-Video. What you want to do is start the WinTV application, switch to S-Video in whatever mode you want, 
Now close that application and go back to the capture program. As long as you're careful about what settings you poke around, the card won't reset and it'll stay in whatever state the WinTV application left it in. So, as you can see, we have an S-Video input here. If it switched back to Composite, it will default to PAL because of the way I've set it up and it would be monochrome right now. So we're definitely using the S-Video input. Kind of pointless though for the resolution we're capturing at. But let's hit record on this thing. Now we wait while the recording takes place and your remaining drive space is going to be flushed down the toilet very quickly. I wouldn't do anything else with the system whilst the capture is happening because, well, it's, it uses quite a lot of resources and the sound card is used for audio recording so any sounds you make could make it into the recorded video. When you're done you can hit escape or click the mouse to stop the recording, wait for the last few frames to write and view or save the video. Your mouse might become quite unresponsive whilst capturing is in progress. And I can import this captured video into the timeline and show you what it looks like. I would imagine Vegas and YouTube's compression is going to make it look kind of blocky. But yeah, it's pretty ugly. I'll be leaving the files captured here for download in the description, along with some files I didn't show, just for the hell of it, so you can check them out yourself. VLC should be able to play them. I'd like to show you full speed uncompressed video, but this system is not fast enough. There's just no way we can do it. Interestingly, the Cinema Pro can't capture at all in this machine, possibly due to issues with plug and play, given the computer doesn't have this feature. It seems to have problems with the buffer, and it probably is worth noting uh, some things you might notice if you try to use one of these. If it captures one frame and stops, you need to move the cards buffer memory address. There's something wrong with it. So yeah, you got to mess with memory holes and uh, EMM386 exclusions again. If you get artifacting like this, your card's frame buffer is conflicting with your video card's frame buffer and you need to move it. If you can't fix it, then it's just not going to work in your machine. There are simply machines it won't work in. Even the manual admits this. There's anything prior to uh, a Pentium 100, really, you, you're going to have some kind of difficulty, I would think. So yeah, we've, we've picked the right machine to put this in here, haven't we? Now, having done some math and spent a couple hours playing with it, it seems we can do 320x240 YUV411 at 25 frames per second with 11 kHz stereo sound. This uses the AuraVision Aura 1 codec. Unfortunately, I can't drop these onto the Vegas timeline, as Vegas has no concept of what Aura's codecs are. VLC can play it though, but only Aura 1. I can't play the Aura 2 YUV422 codec. It appears the VPX chipset on the WinTV acts just as much a decoder as it does an encoder, because you can play back the recorded files using the WinTV card as an accelerator. I will include the captured files in the description for educational purposes to show you how far you can actually go on a system like this. This is really quite impressive, almost on par with some analog TV broadcasts. I would say it was entirely usable for standard definition for quite a few things. I'm not sure I'd want to use it all the time, but yeah, you could certainly get away with it. It's, it's more than acceptable. Also. I will include the 422 file because if you can play it on a modern system, this is the one with the Aura 2 codec, I'd like to know which application you used and how you did it. I can see a thumbnail but it will only play audio in VLC and Vegas and the K-Lite codec pack and that, they just can't read this thing. Now be warned, capture is much more sensitive to oddities or weaknesses in signals. I can't capture the 386 at more than a quarter resolution because sync with the signal cannot be gained. Also, be careful with buffers and overloading the system. If something's wrong, no frames will capture, or the capture will simply get so far and then grab no more frames, likely due to a buffer underrun of some kind. 
getting the most out of your system is very specific to your system. It's a precise science and it requires a lot of experimentation. And in my case, a bit of mathematics. I, I You can fast track it if you know the innards of the machine well enough. As these are fat drives, I would recommend defragmenting them. Do not defragment an NTFS volume, though. They're not really set up for larger sequential access, and it's better to have a dedicated fat partition if you have a machine that's using NTFS volumes, or else you would at least need an NTFS volume which would appear to be fragmented to the system because of the way things have been written to it sequentially. The temporary file that is written when capturing really benefits from just the continual route for sequential writing with minimal seek time. It's beyond the scope of this video to discuss the physical differences with how both file systems store data on a disk, but I shall leave links to further reading below. The short version is, however, that FAT stores things kind of more like a vinyl record, where NTFS would look more like an orb web with random flies stuck all over it. It may be possible to show you full quality from the celebrity though, because still images can be captured at the maximum resolution, and the ones that we've seen are. They're also in true colour, so if your computer is fast enough, it should be possible in video form in one way or another. I would imagine you'd still have to use the AuraVision codec due to the bus limitations. Still, it's actually quite impressive, leaving the WinTV celebrity surprisingly close to the quality of the Express from a decade later, and even the EasyCap, both of which it can surpass in regards to signal compatibility, uh, at least for viewing. Now, I'd be very happy with that quality today for standard definition, to be honest, and I would definitely have been happy with it in 1995, given I didn't have a VCR of my own at that time, and I only had a black and white television. Sure, the family had a VCR and a colour TV, but even those had their limitations, and probably weren't much, if any, better than the capture card. Both the top-loading Ferguson VCR and 70s Hitachi TV used RF cables only, no SCAR or even composite options available. Those, that was good kit, though. I, I liked that VCR, and especially that TV. Now, look at the size of that image file, and imagine pushing 25 of those over the ISA bus every second, as well as audio. You can actually simulate what the bus contention uh, would feel like, I guess, and you've possibly experienced it if you've ever used a remote desktop session over a 100 meg Ethernet line. Yeah, you'll probably get about as much bandwidth as uh, a good ISA bus there, and... Yeah, you know, after the overhead, it's going to be about the same. Notice how you get lag when you move large objects and such. It gives you an idea what they were dealing with here. Yeah, you may have noticed there's this one pixel thick pink line at the left hand edge of the display window or on things that appear above the display. So I thought maybe there was something wrong with the card at first, but no, it says it right in the manual that that's always there. So I guess that's just normal operation. I mean, I wondered if it had gone out of calibration over time. Anyone who owns an analog synthesizer will tell you high precision analog parts drift out over time, and in that case, it will knock the synthesizer out of tune. In the case of this card, I figured, you know, it's, it's just introducing that, but no, that's apparently something it does. And you can't get rid of it no matter how far you shift the display configuration to the left. Uh, which, while I'm speaking about that, I should set the interleave to 3, because I have the third memory chip installed in the socket. That's what that's for, that's for interleaving the uh, memory in the frame buffer on the card. So yeah, I use interleave memory banks, which is, well, it should perform quite well in theory, that frame buffer it should be able to go quite fast. Very strange piece of hardware, you know, there wasn't single ASIC design specialised stuff yet, but we were sort of getting there, we are right on the edge of it, I think. Obviously, I can't try to watch TV or receive teletext as those services are gone, but I'd be willing to bet the features on the card probably work at least as well as they ever did. The VT Plus teletext application seemed almost identical to the one included with the Express over a decade later, so it likely changed very little in that time. It was always a tiny bit awkward to use versus a television set or some of the competing boards. Uh, such as the Mercury uh, card that I had. 
I even seem to recall 888, the page you requested to display subtitles, wasn't really something you could do, but the pages were readable. It's a shame, really. I, I could have done a mini-review of those weird teletext games that used to be around. Kind of odd how close the date in the manual is to the date Bamboozle last appeared. And it is a screenshot of our Channel 4, too. Of course, you could somewhat cheat at such things on the PC, as you could often actually look at where the hidden fast text buttons were going and where they'd take you, much the same way you can bypass some of those supposedly unskippable DVD features with any half-decent computer software or get into the Easter eggs that are supposed to be well hidden. Things which are generally impossible with a run-of-the-mill television or DVD player, and devices which are a total waste of money, and in any house that has a half-decent computer in it, really. At least in my mind. I can use RF input on the Cinema Pro, though, just to prove that it works. And yeah, it does. So, well, if we had TV signals, there's no reason it wouldn't pick those up, given that that's basically what's coming out of the ass end of the VCR, though. So, it's there if I need it, but given I've got composite and S-video, I'm not likely to. This also lets me point out something a lot of people seem to miss, though. These old games were made for RF and composite cables. The softer images that these cables produce, that are slightly blurred, is actually good. The games often use dithering as a trick to get around limited colour palettes or emulate transparency. Note how different Rystar looks between S-Video and Composite, or how passable even that Duke Nukem 3D thing looks when running in RF cables. Yeah, the, that banding everybody complains about, you can't even see it, so you start thinking, maybe they actually put it there on purpose. I sure as hell think they did. I think that was the intention. I believe that banding was a clever mode of getting around palette limitations, and you're supposed to play the game with the lesser cables. Something you might want to think about before you start adding RGB mods to your consoles. I'm not saying don't put them on, but just be aware, you might actually be making it look worse. The developers probably intended a softened out image, as that would have been the cables people were using at the time the game was made. There's something of an art form to getting it right. There's not really much else to say about the capture card, though, other than it does seem to work, and I'm generally quite impressed with it. It may be worth my time to point out that the connector here is not a VGA feature connector, so don't attempt to connect it to your video card, because it'll blow up, or it seems that it will, given how the voltages look when probed with a meter. Also, the internal audio header on the Sura Pro shouldn't be used, because the voltages are abnormally high, no audio comes out of it, and it's probably going to break something. Just just leave the internal headers alone, use the external cables for everything. The, the manual is quite inaccurate when it comes to headers, and it can't be trusted. It numbers some of them in reverse, uh, puts them in places that are outright incorrect, if it bothers to describe their existence at all, and on my card it misses one, but lists the other jumper that's not actually there, it's a total mess. Now, on feature connectors, there were cards which did work that way, including Hopage's previous entry from around 1992, and this would interface directly with your video card internally. The interface was fast, and it could carry both digital and analog signals. Cards using this sometimes wrote directly into the card's frame buffer, much like the S3 Scenic does, and are therefore theoretically capable of delivering much higher quality images and much less mess than the analog colour keying method used by the WinTV celebrity. That isn't a given, as some still used analog keying on these cables. This also doesn't facilitate writing the data back to the system any faster. Much like the chroma key method, it does bypass limitations of the CPU, RAM and bus for viewing, but to actually record you'd still be dependent on the internal bus of the system, clearly, as should be obvious. So, to all intents and purposes, they were just two different ways of achieving the same outcome, with minor pros and cons in either case. I believe Hopage's older cards were using analog means, and therefore they function identically to the celebrity in that regard. They just moved the cable inside the system for neater effect, I suppose. ATI would probably have to be the most effective at pushing such cards with their AMC feature connector, 
and TV Wonder series. These cards are much more modern in their appearance and operation, though the BT-829 seems to be pretty much the same chip the Cinema Pro uses for the bulk of its operations. ATI simply had a more streamlined implementation due to offering VGA cards already and therefore been able to put their own proprietary connector there for it, letting them tie the two together quite seamlessly. You should be able to dodge the limits of the ISA bus with this too, because it only uses the bus for power and everything else, even communication with the system at large, is handled by the VGA card which is PCI or AGP. Obviously Hoppage couldn't do this, unless they started building video cards themselves, and neither method really lasted, but the ATI implementation is clearly much prettier, and the All-in-Wonder series with capture capabilities built onto the VGA card itself lasted into 2008. Today even cards like the NVIDIA Quadro SDI, which will use a lot of bandwidth, rely solely on the system bus to transport everything, they don't connect to the video card at all. Nonetheless, my closing notes on the ATI are that it doesn't offer any hardware encoding, unlike the WinTV, and it relies on the host system, seeming to recommend at least a Pentium 100 for the ATI VCR1 format, and it can do MPEG-2 on a fast Pentium 2. This shows the transitions to a more scaled-down software-oriented capture device was already afoot, and in fact, it's almost like a stepping stone between being reliant on the video cards and having chips and wires all over the place. You can see how we're transitioning to a much more streamlined, single ASIC design. We're not quite there yet, but you can see it's getting there. It's like the midpoint between the two. Hell yeah, ATI. They know what men want. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. So outside of its use of the AMC connector, it's not really that far away from later analogue cards like the Ava TV 90 It's clearly what it's trying to be. I would say it is the better card here versus the Win TV, but it's newer, so you would expect that. And I can't test the closed captioning and such, but damn it, I had this down. This software is absolutely brilliant, and it's very feature-rich. I like this thing very much, but overall... I find the Win TV way more impressive just for the fact that it works at all. I mean, look how long ago it is and look what it's running in. That's just cool, man. Now, needless to say, I have included sample files from the cards we've mentioned here, and you can download these in the description for educational purposes, of course, to see, you know, what the card was capable of and compare them to things yourself if you'd like to. But I think we're about done here. This has gotten very, very long, and I always knew it would. So I'll pass you back to that obnoxious cameraman now. Yeah, I think that says about all there is to say here, really. I mean, we all know what it culminated in. I don't need to explain to you what modern capture hardware looks like and what it does. Uh, people are, are aware of it now. It's not like 10, 12 years ago when nobody had heard of it. Like, even people who were really into PCs didn't know that it was something you could do. It's very strange to think now. So, yeah, I think we've covered about these cards anyway. There's not so we won't get some older ones down the line, but I don't think I'm likely to, because I, I can't think of anything I would do with them. Like, I would have no use for them, and they're just very awkward pieces of hardware, from what I can tell. So, you know, I've, I've seen one that didn't even interface with the video card. It had, like, its own composite monitor and all these weird things. It, oh, man, it, it got off to a rocky start, because... PCs weren't good at this kind of thing back then. They just weren't. It wasn't standardised yet. You've got to start somewhere. There was no specialised hardware. But if you want to have a look at what was out there, it's not easy to find. And as I've said, as we're going into odd peripherals like this more and more, it's harder to find documentation and history of it because people just didn't bother preserving this stuff as well as, like, say, processors or like graphics cards or something so yeah you'd be surprised i always tell like you know info world things like that are a great place to look but photography magazines old photography magazines and catalogs a lot of it shows up in there i've, I've found quite a few and even if it's just adverts it is in there which makes sense when you think about it because it was not like you could just shove an SD card in the, a USB slot back then. That would probably have been your only way of getting pictures into the computer. So yeah, there's a lot of old imaging and video hardware in those. 
uh, if you look hard enough, you can find it. So that's uh, something to be aware of if this is something you want to look farther into on your own. But I think we have about covered it uh, for today. I don't really have anything else to add. This video has gone on long enough. This is probably going to be about an hour long, I think. I'm not sure. Which is excessive, but whatever. <laughs> it, it's hard to figure out what information do you cut out, what do you keep in, how technical do you go with things, how... Uh, yeah, I don't know, man. It's, it's hard to figure out where to draw a line. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, I, I should really get out of here. I, I've come up with a worse ending uh, phrase. I'm like, I should be like, be a pro, use DOS 5.0. But, I don't know, I don't do this thing. It's like I keep thinking about putting music in the background of my videos, but I'm like, it'd just be a crap synth beat or something, but I'm like, nah, I shouldn't do that, because it annoys me when other people do it. If you want music on, you just open another tab, don't you? But, yeah, with that, I guess until next time, I'm High Treason, thanks a lot for watching. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't do what I said I would do, that being the Pentium Pro, and I'll see you again in the future. Oh, I almost forgot. Hey, LGR, I can go smaller. <laughs> <laughs>